Fedheads, you're tuning in to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 109, Spotlight on Nika Rustica. I'm your host, John, the Cigar Surgeon. Sharing Our Pairings did broadcast live around the world and picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network. And of course, we're broadcast live at CigarFederation.com, YouTube.com, and Facebook Live. Thanks to all our podcast listeners out there. We don't forget about you guys. You see you listening all around the world, from India to Bangladesh, from... Italy to Mexico and every place in between. Thanks so much for tuning in wherever you are in the world. Hope you're enjoying this little bit of entertainment. I am joined as always by my co-host, Drippy Trent. Drippy, what's going on, buddy? Hey, buddy. I've got a, uh, a pork in the smoker right now. A little oh, pork shoulder yeah. going. Oh, um, yeah. It should be done just about the same time we're done with the show. Um, and hopefully there's no flame outs or anything back there because I'm not there to watch it. Well, there's... <clears throat> with with a pork, pork shoulder on the on the barbecue on the smoker, there there ain't gonna be no after dark tonight. I don't think. Uh, we'll see. Eh. We uh, of course are smoking as the spotlight. The spotlight is is Nica Rustico from uh, Drew Estate. I'm uh, kind of rocking the Drew Estate uh, Drew Estate uh, swag, and so are you tonight. Got the hat, got the shirt. Uh, I'm smoking the monster monster cigar, and we were talking pre-show because I'm just kind of. You know, it's a cigar kind of night. It's like 82 freedom degrees here. It's hot. And I'm just I'm just puffing away, just puffing like It's raging. Man. It's raging. And I'm smoking the the little guy in the line, the short yeah, Robusto. Right. Now, what's interesting is those are the, um, of course, the, the two new, quote unquote, new ones. Um, I think the belly was released in, God, I want to say, uh, is it 2015? I believe I don't even remember. so. It was, it, was it was right after my first uh, cigar safari. Oh, yeah. I believe it. So it must have been 2015. Because mm. we got a belly in our kit uh, way before it came out. Yeah, that's right. So I've been kind of hanging on to this since then. I think this is actually the one from the kit. And a little bit about the specs. It's a 7.5 by 54 belly, belly coso. And you can see I, I did V-cut it. You can V-cut. I used my Jaws V-cutter, and it uh, cut through that like no problem. Uh, wrapper on this bad boy is Connecticut Broadleaf, which is why it's so delish. Use a Mexican San Andreas binder and then uh, fillers from Jalapa and Esteli. The MSRP on the belly is only $7.95, which you can see why someone would buy something this big if it's 8 bucks. I mean, you got probably darn near three hours of smoke time there. Yeah, think. that that thing's going to last you a little while. A little while. Um, and I'm, as I said before, I'm smoking the short Robusto. Uh, I think the MSRP. Let me look I at it. Say here. it's like six ninety five or something like that. Five ninety five. Five ninety five. Oh yeah, these things. I are mean, affordable. Smoke those. Smoke those by the wheel at five ninety five. Yeah, uh, it's of course the same blend. I while I haven't heard anything, I suspect that this one has a little bit of extra lajero for that kick, while oh. the belly has a little bit less than the original El Brujito size. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this is four and a half by fifty, with a, a closed foot and a weird little cap, not Got quite the like the upper Yeah, a little bit different. A little twisty cap. Yeah. So of course, uh, for those who are aren't aware, you can see the El Burrito on there, the little logo. And on and, here. And on there. Rocking that swag. Uh, now, of course, that has some significance historically because that actually that symbol goes back six thousand years and was found at the head of a tributary in Nicaragua. So they know that it was the indigenous people that were there that painted that, and they painted it on a rock. And if you're down in Esteli, you had to take a visit to the, uh, the like a, it's like a historical center, and they have a bunch of paintings, and they have a huge rock. It, now, is, do you know, do you remember, if that is that the original rock? It They've is. Got, that is the original, is that the original rock? rock. Interesting. So, of course, El Burrito was the, um, was the shaman. And I think that's literally what it translates to, is shaman. Uh, it's actually witch doctor. Witch doctor, yeah. Is the, the translation. And the cigar kind of has an interesting history, a kind of interesting birth. Kind of like the, a uh, little bit like the underground, actually. And I know you love telling the story, so you want to yes. drop that one I on our I've listeners? I think i told the story like three times in the At last least. week. To different people. Uh, so, as almost everybody knows... The Liga Pravadas were very, very hard to get when they first came out. 
Uh, they would just fly off the shelves. They couldn't keep them on the shelf. They couldn't roll enough of them because they didn't have enough fermented tobacco. Because I, I, w- I would guess because they didn't realize they were going to blow up the way they did. And the rollers would not stop smoking them because they're so good. So good. And and so the the higher ups at Drew Estate decided, okay, the rollers need to blend their own cigar that's similar to the Liga Pravada. That's exactly what they want. And that way they'll stop smoking all these Liga Provados because we can't be having them smoke these, you know, $15, $17 cigars. So they had them come up with a blend, and I'm not sure exactly how it worked out, but from what I've been told, they ended up presenting two blends That's what to I the higher saying. ups. Yep. And the two blends were the Undercrown and the Nico Rustica. And they smoked the Undercrown and said, This thing's fantastic. We're gonna you can start making these and start smoking them. It's so good. We're actually going to start marketing them. And then of course the undercrown was unveiled. Uh, fast forward. I don't know the exact timeline, maybe a year or so. And the rollers are t- smoking too many undercrowns. They can't make enough <laughs> of them. Uh, so then they started making some Nico Rusticas for them to smoke. And then of course those became uh, available on the market as well. And in addition to being, a cool story and stuff. It's a way for them to use up some of those broadleaf tobaccos that they buy, but don't really use in any of the, in any of the, uh, Liga Pravadas, uh, because this is a lower priming than the Liga Pravadas. Yeah. My understanding is that the wrapper on the Nica Rustica is, is also used on the Feral Flying Pig, but for anyone who's smoked a Feral Flying Pig, you know, the profile is radically different from the Nica Rustica, mm-hmm. like night and day different. And, you know, the name of the game, especially with the tobacco operation as big as Drew Estate, is that you got to maximize your yield. You got to maximize your util- your utilization of tobacco. You can't be using expensive or even inexpensive tobaccos in just one cigar. You, you know, the name of the game is to try and use that cigar, that blend, that tobacco in as many cigars as you can to maximize profitability. So it is, you know, it is important to not only come up with a, with a great product, but obviously you need to make it a cost-effective product that, that utilizes your tobaccos in the right way. Yeah. And, and something a lot of people probably don't know is that when Drew Estate got involved with the farms that grow the Connecticut Broadleaf and the Connecticut Habano that are used in the Liga Pravada lines, when they got involved in those, they were kind of bound to buying the entire farm worth yeah. of tobacco. They didn't, they didn't buy, you know, 50 bales of Lajero, which is what you would normally do. You say what you want. And with these tobaccos they just ended up with everything um so i would guess that when the when the el brujito first came out they had a lot of that uh i think it, they call it connecticut broadly mediums which is the viso and my understanding is they actually had to make a couple tweaks to get the nico rusty there's a couple back and forth to get it just right they, they pulled out some of the filler tobaccos and, and adjusted it just to make it the right flavor but i think in the end there's a lot of people that will actually act, and I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but they'll actively choose the, the uh, Nico Rustica over the Undercrown now because they actually prefer the flavor profile to the Undercrown. Yeah, uh, which, I which, could know. certainly believe that. I mean, for broadleaf nuts, it's perfect. Yeah, it's not strong. Like, you know, that's the nice thing about the Undercrown and the Nico Rustica. Like, this is this is what I would call an everyday smoke, you know? Like, you can light up a couple of these. In fact, that, you know, I was always ta- already talking about the fact that I'm just hammering this. And, uh, you know, it's not strong. It's, it's like perfectly, me- perfectly medium. This is the kind of cigar that I could go out and just puff and puff and puff. And I don't have to worry about paying attention to it. I just have a really good experience. My palate isn't getting jacked up by the tobaccos. It's not burning too hot. It's just, it's a great cigar. And the flavors, I mean, you know, I think the Undercrown for me is a little bit spicier, like quite a bit spicier. Oh yeah, actually. way spicier. Yeah. Where the Nico Rustica has that that I kind of describe as like a little bit of nuttiness and some sweetness. So this with coffee is, you know, crazy, crazy good. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's not overly complex. While complexity is usually a good thing in cigars, Mm. at a certain point you have to be paying attention. You're not going to be able to really appreciate some of the flavors. I mean, there are cigars that I've smoked that if I'm, I'm distracted, I can smoke the whole thing. And when I get to the end thing, I guess that was okay. Uh, yep. And then I smoke it a few days later, focusing on it. And it's like, wow, this thing's amazing. And this is the cigar that you're going to be satisfied either way. Now, I, I will say that if you uh, if you are a retrohaler 
and you should probably retrohale if you want to get the most out of your cigars. But if you retrohale this cigar, you are going to get a little bit of that spice. And it's not a peppery spice. It's not a biting spice like you might get with some of the Liga Pravada Unicos. It's more of what I would call a baking spice. And then it's got that great sweetness. And I'd say it's got like almost a toasted caramel, almost like a creme brulee underneath that. And and all the flavors are are very balanced. Like none of those flavors, you know, like I take a retro hell and my nose is just completely clean afterwards. It's not uh, stinging. I don't find that that spice kind of sticks with me. So it's, um you know, very, very approachable cigar. Yeah, there's a little heat on the retro hell, but not to the point where it, it lingers at all. Oh. And of course, when we go down on the Drew State Cigar Safari, we pretty much smoke. I want to say that the group probably smokes two plus bundles of these in a day, easily. Yeah, these and the T52s are kind of the the big winners. And imagine Drew Estate. I mean, they don't care, right? That's the great thing about going on Safari. They don't care. They just put cigars out and they say have fun and smoke as much as you want. But at the end of the day, I'm sure the accountants, the bean counters, probably prefer us to smoke the Nica Rusticas over the uh, Liga Profada T52. I would guess so, yeah. Yeah. But we're not just smoking tonight. We are, in fact, pairing. And uh, I'm, I've kind of I've been cheating the entire night because, uh, you know, we have a we have a green room pre-show, and uh, I've been kind of sipping on my first drink for probably a better part of 30 minutes now. It's hot. I like a good whiskey when it's hot. And uh, so we're just going to jump right in, and that's just how it's going to go. We might run a little short on time, but, you know, whatever. So this is a classic... We've had it on the show many, many times. If you see this on the shelf, if you're a whiskey drinker, you should buy it. You should buy mm-hmm. it immediately. They're hard to find. Uh, I was talking to somebody who just got back from Japan, and I told him, you know, if you can get me any Yamazaki. And he said he walked into his shops and said, uh, Yamazaki? And uh, the shop owners just kind of laughed. They just, <laughs> oh, Yamazaki is a funny story. No Yamazaki. Now, yeah, ever did, since they got that whiskey of the year. It's- yeah. Thanks, thanks, Jim Murray. Way to ruin it for the rest of us, jerk. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I think that was the 18, but, you know, everyone is, you know, not going to spend $225 on a Yamazaki 18. They want to get the Yamazaki 12. So now the Yamazaki 12 can't be found anywhere. And as I understand it, they are releasing a Yamazaki no-age statement because he said there's a lot of no-age statement over there for Yamazaki, but he didn't have a chance to try it. So Yeah, that's my I think Yamazaki I heard statement. that's coming out, but I, uh-huh. I have no idea when. So... I'll just refresh our audience who weren't paying attention to our last 108 episodes. And by the way, we are coming up on a three-year anniversary quite quickly here in July. Three years sharing our pairings. Three years. We're going to have a little something special to celebrate at the uh, first week of July. You can check out our event calendar at CigarFederation.com. But getting back to the whiskey, this is from Suntory Beam. Suntory Beam. They are the owners of Yamazaki. Uh, Yamazaki hailed as the first whiskey distillery, although Trip will have something to say about that. Uh, opened in 1923, um, first commercial distillery in Japan. So maybe that's how they, they ah, uh, by it. first commercial distillery, uh, located in Shimamoto. And, uh, the cool thing, if you got a chance to go to Shimamoto and do a distillery tour, you got to do it. Cause they're going to give you about 70 varieties of whiskey to try and you can pretty much try it all. And to me, that's kind of worth the price of admission right there. Yeah. That but sounds it, like a reason to go on vacation, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the whiskey, and then I think we're going to have our first ad break, and that'll let you introduce your first spirit, beverage, beer, whatever of the night. Um, so like most Japanese whiskeys, if you've tuned into our Japanese whiskey shows, you'll know that most Japanese whiskey tends to be at 43% ABV. And sure enough, this bad boy is as well. They say the nose is peach, pineapple, grapefruit, clove, candied orange, vanilla, and mizanara. Mizanara is the oak. And uh, tends to have a particular nose to it. Definitely get a have, lot of candied orange. Oh my god! They have apple in there. They don't have. There's. They don't have apple in there. I get a now, ton of apple from that I, particular I, whiskey. I I do as well, actually. And it's more of um, it's more of a ma- um a red delicious than the Macintosh I get off the uh, Hakushu. Mm-hmm. But I mean. It's just it's just a stewed fruit, rich nose, and then they say the palate is coconut, cranberry, and butter. Which all sounds delicious to me, um, but we are going to take a quick break here. And I first just want to remind our audience that you are tuned in to Sharing Our Pairings. Sharing Our Pairings is broadcast live around the world and picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Of course, our home is CigarFederation.com. But you can tune in at YouTube.com and Facebook Live. Stay tuned for a message from one of our sponsors. 
Sharing Our Pairings is brought to you by Gurkha Cigars. Gurkha Cigars, makers of the world's finest cigars. Try the 93-rated Heritage featuring a Rosado, Ecuador, and Habano wrapper, Nicaraguan binder, and Dominican, Pennsylvanian, and Nicaraguan fillers. Blended by Gurkha's blending team at American Caribbean Cigars, it is hand-rolled Nicaragua and available in 35-count boxes. Talk to your local B&M about the Heritage today, or talk to them about other fine Gurkha cigars. Whatever your taste preference is, Gurkha has a cigar that's right for you. Now, if you're a cigar manufacturer and you do want a spiffy ad here at Sharing Our Pairings or Cigar Chat, you can get in touch with me and we'll hook you up. Surgeon at CigarFederation.com. Now, we're going to get back to our pairing here. Uh, I'm going to take some sippies and let you talk about what your first lineup of the night is. Uh, so I was in a specialty grocery store this week and they happened to have some Japanese beers. So Ooh. I didn't even think about you doing the uh, Yamasaki first, but I decided to try... Uh, a Japanese IPA, which you don't see too often. Never this even is, heard of such a thing. This is Auni. I think that's how you say it. Uh, it is brewed by uh, Yoho. Brewer. Yoho. And there's actually a really interesting story behind them that reveals part of uh, sort of Japanese beer culture that I never knew about. Until 1994... Japan would not give you a license to brew beer unless you made 2 million liters. Wow. Uh, or 528,000 freedom gallons. Uh, but that is a ton of beer. Especially so, for a first, first-time first brewer. Yeah. So, I mean, it was completely pretty much just limited to those massive Japanese lager brewers that we're all familiar with. Wow. In 1994, they relaxed the laws and the minimum became 60,000 liters or 16,000 freedom gallons where you could get a, uh, a I, don't, I don't know exactly what they call it, but you could get a, a tax license to brew beer. And so that happened in 1994. In 1996, this company, Yoho, was established as a subsidiary of a resort management company called Hoshino Resort Company, hmm. which is really interesting. They they basically started this brewery just so that they would have craft beer at their resorts. Doing it right. Yeah. And they say that they wanted to kind of create beer culture since it didn't really exist in Japan. In Japan, a beer was a beer. It was just lager. That's all you got. If you ordered a beer, you would get one of the like six or so lagers. And then now, of course, there's kind of a, a craft resurgence. Um, in Japan. So in 2010, this particular beer won uh, the silver medal for the English style IPA at the International Beer Competition. And they were also named Brewery of the Year uh, by the Jap Japanese Craft Brew Association. Wow. And then in 2014, 30% of the ownership was actually sold to Kirin. So now they're kind of involved with the big guys. Uh, and I couldn't get any stats on exactly how much beer they make, but it seems like they're kind of making a lot these days. So that brings me to this, which is Auni. It is their standard IPA. It's based on the, the old English style, uh, kind of a, a medium bodied 63 IBUs and a, what they call a high alcohol in Japan, 7%, which is kind of typical for IPAs mm -hmm. out here. Uh, so I'm going to take a couple sips of this delicious looking IPA while, Definitely looks while like you an talk IPA. about, yeah, while you talk about your Yamazaki 12. And no surprise, Yamazaki 12, it's good. Um, I don't know if I get the coconut so much as I get, um, and I've, I've always kind of gotten this in the, on the, uh, Yamazakis. It's more of, um, like a spiced candied orange. Like to me, it kind of reminds me of Christmas time. Cause it's kind of like a, like a spice cake. Um, so you get like a ton of that fruit flavor, you get, um, the spices really lingering post draw. In fact, it's funny because I think if you were to pair this with a different Drew Estate product, it might not be right, but because the, the whiskey here is bringing the spice and the cigar is not bringing the spice, they work really well together. The cigar brings the sweetness, the cigar brings that, or the whiskey brings that, that spice and that complexity. Um, very good together. I, I don't, you know, they talk about cranberry, I don't get any of the cranberry, for me, it's, it's, you know, a little bit of uh, red delicious apple, 
a lot of candied orange, a little bit of vanilla. I don't get the grapefruit quality. Um, but you know, along with the spices, it's, uh, it's good. And I mean, I'm surprised I managed to hang on to this bottle for as long as I have, and I haven't managed to polish it off yet. Yeah, I'm always surprised that I still have a bottle of Yamasaki 12 sitting around. I think it's mostly because of the price. I just don't want to buy another bottle. Yeah. I want to keep that one. Or even try to find it. Now, what's interesting to me, the um, IPA that you've got, because, I mean... Japan, and I know this because um, back when I was younger, we had some uh, Japanese exchange students. It will really um, open my eyes to Japanese food culture versus sort of westernized food culture was the fact that they don't go for, there's no such, like they don't go for big over the top. They don't go for super spicy. They don't go for super salty. They don't go for um, super sugary. Uh, so they find something that's really, you know, flavor forward to be offensive they don't like that it's too yeah. much it's not their style um which is why they have a lot of snack foods that are you know probably considered quite dull by western standards so it's interesting to me that an ip iba ipa would be on the list because you know even by western standards a lot of people don't like ipas because they find them just too hot too bitter forward well so as i said before they they won a medal for the english style ipa and this right. is definitely an English style IPA. It's a little more malty, uh, less of those like fruity, grassy notes that you're used to, and more just of a bitter finish. Uh, even though the IBUs are fairly solid at 63, kind of middle of the road for American IPAs. Yeah. But yeah, because sorry, you're not getting a punch of bitterness like you do with an American IPA or a West Coast IPA. You're mm -hmm. getting more of the sweetness and caramelly kind of flavors from the malt and like biscuity flavors. And then just kind of a nice uh, bitter finish that's not too sharp. Now, did they reveal, not that it would necessarily mean anything to me, but did on their website, did they reveal any details as to what uh, hops they're using or where they're getting their hops? I assume they have to be importing them. I would think so, but no, they they don't really give any information whatsoever on that. Of course not. Why would they? Yeah, exactly. So if we turn to our audience feed on Facebook Live and CigarFederation.com, uh, how are we doing for audience feedback, questions, and comments? Uh, Mo Molly, who we had on the show a few weeks ago, says we look like cigar models. You're damn right we do. <laughs> Mike Harvey says he loves your shirt. It's, Thanks, I mean, Mike. it's a sweet shirt. It is pretty sweet. Um, and he also said he hasn't had much Japanese beer. It's really, really tough to find Japanese beer, Mike. Yeah. Uh, the only places that I can generally find it is uh, Whole Foods sometimes has a little bit. I got this at a place called Zupans. They are local to the Portland metro area. And they're basically uh, like if you went to Whole Foods and everything was double the price. We only stopped there because we were on our way home from a thing with the kids and the kids had to use the bathroom. Uh, it's not a place I normally shop because it's very expensive, <laughs> but their beer selection is ridiculous. Uh, and then so you've got a Japanese grocery store. If you've got a Japanese grocery store around you, mm. that's probably your best bet. So this is one of the rare moments where I think I have a bit of an advantage because my local beer store, local quote unquote, uh, Kensington Wine Market, they do stock quite a bit of uh, Japanese beer. So I've actually had the chance to try the, um, I think it's a Hitachi. Uh, I've tried Kirin, obviously. I've tried like all the mainstay big brewery stuff, but I've also had a chance to try some of the smaller stuff. Um, and I kind of like it. I mean, it's, you know, it's not at least the stuff that isn't like, a, like you said, the lager. Because, um, you know, I like lagers, but to me, lagers don't really bring the flavor. I mean, lager is a lager is a lager. And, and you can feel free to send comments about that to Sergeant Cigar Federation dot com. Um, but I, I mean, I've really enjoyed the the flavor profiles because uh, they're not overwhelming. You know, they're interesting, they're nuanced, and uh, you know, it's part of. I, th I think I think on Untapped, I think I've, I'm at level two Japanese beer now, just because I've managed to find some great, in, like unique Japanese beers at Kensington Wine Market. So I'm always in the hunt whenever I go in there. I'm like, you know, do you have anything? from uh, from Norway, do you have anything from Japan? And they commonly bring in stuff every, you know, couple of quarters or whatever that's new that I've never seen before. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, I, I think being in the Northwest, a, a blessing and a curse uh, of having the most uh, breweries within a metro area, which we do have here, 
Um, it's great because they're every single store has more beer than you could ever like try all of them. But unless you're most, Matt. unless you're Matt, but most of what we have comes from this area. Huh. I mean, we don't get a lot of imported beer or um, you know small production beers from out of state. Makes sense. Well, I yeah. mean, you know, if 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 you're producing, and, and you know, Portland obviously and all of Oregon is producing some really fantastic beer. So if you're producing that kind of fantastic beer, it's kind of one of those things. Like if you had, if you're sitting in Miami and Miami was producing most of the cigars in the world, and someone comes along with a cigar that's manufactured out of Miami, it's like, well, you know, we have a lot of shelf space dedicated to local stuff that sells really well. Yeah, Tough to dedicate exactly. that shelf space to an import, and especially if that import costs more. You know, you got to think from yeah, a retail perspective. Yeah, which they they typically do. I mean, I think. This one can of this was like four bucks or something. Four bucks. Something like that. It was crazy. That's like Canadian prices, man. That is crazy. <laughs> so this first pairing's good. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to go wrong with the Yamazaki 12. I mean, I find as far as Japanese whiskeys, it's it's a lot more in your face. It's a lot more Scotch, a Scottish style whiskey. So the, the flavors are a lot more uh, prominent, a lot more in your face. Uh, and therefore, you know, pairs a lot better with a range of cigars and certainly pairs really well with the Nica Rustica. Uh, I think, I think we had a bottle of Japanese whiskey one time when we were down at Drew Estate, um, that I brought with us. Um, you know, and it just, it paired brilliantly with a lot of Drew Estate cigars. So really no surprise here that it's pairing really well. Um, how's the pairing going for you so far? Good. It's, uh, I think the sweetness of the beer covers up the sweetness of the cigar a little bit, mm. but it's bringing out some kind of cedary spicy flavors that I wasn't getting before. Nice. I can dig it. Yeah, it's good, but not not fantastic. We'll talk more about it later. Fair enough. Well, I'm going to get into our second pairing before we take our next break. I'll try and squeeze it in here. I might have to stop halfway through, but another show favorite, Rogue Ales and Spirits, which is kind of, you know, it's obviously in your backyard. And, and Rogue has kind of um, started out as, I think, this getting this this view is like it's it's so craft but it's been around for so long that people just don't consider it craft anymore which is kind of weird because um and they also you know, they make a ton of beer now they do make a ton of beer um this is one of my standby favorites and i think the uh the, the image on the bottle kind of fits the style of the show and kind of fits the style of drew estate it's a rogue dead guy ale and it's got a, a skeleton with a beer in his hand and some kind of weird fuzzy cap on um I'm a big fan of Rogue products. I think they're produced well, and I think they have quality ingredients. I'm just going to read their mission statement here because I think it's really cool. First of all, they they started a brew pub in 1998, 1988, pardon me, and took 10 years off them in Ashland, Oregon. And I could talk about the brewery, but I just I love their their mission statement. So I'm just going to read it. Um, they want to brew the finest varietal ales and spirits in the world with an uncompromising devotion to quality and the art of brewing. So listen up if you're talking about boutique. To present the finished work with a touch of education, entertaining mischief. To be dedicated to the rogue and all of us. To remember it is not simply a matter of profit, but a highly personal work of art. Again, boutique. To build relationships, not just ales. And to be like great friends and remember what it's, like, what it's inside that counts. And all of those things to me kind of, you know, harken back to uh, when I was on the Primetime Live with Coop and he was talking about what is boutique. And to me, all of those statements are what is boutique. I mean, you want to ask what boutique is, that's boutique you know, presents like a pretty traditional ale. It looks like an ale, feels like an ale, smells like an ale. Oh, super malty. Man, crazy, crazy malty. I'm very excited for this. But before I take a sip, before we get into it, I do want to take a break and get to our next show sponsor. Reminder to audience, we are t- you are tuned in live to Sharing Our Pairings, episode 109, Spotlight on Nika Rustica from Drew Estate. I'm your host, John, the Cigar Surgeon, joined by my co-host, Trippy Trent. We are broadcast live around the world. And we can be heard on podcast everywhere in the world that podcast catchers are. We are on all of them. Stay tuned for a word from our sponsor. This show is sponsored by Cigar Oasis. Don't spend all your time worrying about your cigar wrappers cracking, splitting, or falling apart from humidity fluctuation issues. Set it and forget it by choosing Cigar Oasis, a professional solution which provides equal distribution of humidity with precise electronic controls. Monitor your cigars through the internet using the smart humidor Wi-Fi attachment. Why don't you spend all your time enjoying your cigars and relaxing and let Cigar Oasis protect your cigars. Cigar Oasis has solutions for any humidor. Make sure you set it and forget it today. And we are back. So I'm going to take some sippies 
And I'm kind of, I was kind of cheating during the ad spot there, kind of taking some sippies. I'm going to let you talk about your second pairing of the night trip. Um, all right. I've got something a little special here. Uh, some people may never have even seen one of these bottles, but I just walked into a liquor store and they happen to have one. So this is Willet Straight Rye Whiskey. It is the family estate bottled edition. Um, so Willet has kind of a weird history. They started in 1936. And they just kind of, the, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Thompson Willett. He had worked in a couple of distilleries around Kentucky and decided, we're going to build a distillery right here on our farm. So they did. And over time, they grew into more of a bottling company. Huh. And in the 80s, they actually stopped distilling entirely and started bottling exclusively. Um, it's, I can't. I couldn't really find any information on this, really, but it sounded like they stopped even uh, aging their own whiskeys. And then sometime around the 2000s, they started aging their own whiskeys and bottling them again. And in 2012, they actually started refurbishing their distillery. Uh, and this is from, I, I'm, I'm assuming this is the second release, because I know there have been two of these released. Um, but it's actually one of the first products that they've actually distilled on their property. And of course, then aged and bottled on their property. So this is a blend of a high rye, which is 74% rye, 11% corn, 15% malted barley mash bill, and a low rye mash bill, which is 51% rye, so it's still technically rye, 34% corn, 15% malted barley. Um, so that's similar to there's, I know there's at least two other companies doing it, but one of them is High West. They've got a very similar product that they offer. Um, and this is only aged for three years and then bottled at cask strength after being blended. So it's 55.6% alcohol by volume or 111.2 proof. Woo. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a heater and it's really kind of got that on the palate, especially being aged only three years. Um, What's the color of that bad boy? Oh, it's actually kind of the same color as my beer, kind of a, a oh. golden amber, I would call it. And I'm going to take a couple sips of this yeah, special yeah. guy and let you talk about yours. Yeah, before I talk about the palate, which is delicious, I'm going to talk about the specs in this dead guy ale. Got a beer advocate score of 88, which is pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> specs on it, 16 degrees Play-Doh, 40 IBUs, which is, you know, kind of high for an ale, kind of. 78 AAs, uh, if you pay attention to our previous shows, you know what that is. 16 degrees Lova Bond, and they use nine ingredients. They use two row hops, C15 Munich hops, Rogue Farms Dare Risk Malts, Rogue Farms Revolution, and Independent Hops. Free range coastal water, and what makes this one special is their special special pac-man yeast which is not used on all of their beers but it is kind of a, a proprietary yeast to rogue and they recommend food pairing uh spicy pork so kind of kind of fits with the theme the scar's a little bit spicy kind of kind of got a little bit of porky flavor sort of a little bit of sweetness and um it's great i mean i love dead guy ale it's it's to me it's like a quintessential ale that's got a lot more character than just you know, what I typically get on tap at most beer places. So I'm not, I'm not looking for just kind of a generic ale. I want some ale with some oomph, just like with my cigars. I want a little oomph there. And the dead gal delivers. It's, it's just crazy malty, uh, but not overpowering. Like, you know, there's a balance where you can have too much malt. It can be too malty. It can be too sweet and can just jack, jack up your palate. But in this case, it's just got enough of that malty sweetness that it's, it's a great thirst quencher. And on a day like today, Exactly what the uh, doctor ordered. And, and Jason Raybuck says, I, I don't think I've ever noticed, but he says that, that those bottles glow in the dark. I That's interesting. It's just the label. But. That's probably the case. Now, if we were in our wintertime shows, uh, you'd be able to tell that right now because I'd be drinking and smoking in the dark, essentially. So we'd be able to flip off the lights and show that off. But uh, now we're in our summertime. So we get like 17 or 18 hours of sunlight. So, uh, you know, you're going to have to wait five hours before uh, I have a chance to check that out. How's the first few sips going? All right. So 
talking about this Willet rye. Which I, I bet is like super spicy. Very, very spicy. Mm-hmm. It's And it's just got a ton of heat. Like it's hard to get a good nose of it because you kind of get that burn. Because it's just, it's just hot. Yep. But once you get past that, I smell uh, some like, there's definitely some pine and some like stewed kind of like, like cinnamon fruits, like cinnamon apple or something like that in there. And then on the palate, there's a, I mean, it's American whiskey. So there's a ton of vanilla and a little bit of like citrus and kind of a menthol-y finish. It's, it's very different from any rye that I've ever had. Huh. And, and a little sweeter than most ryes, I think. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of rye. I mean, obviously I'm coming from a rye nation. That's really mm-hmm. our spirit of choice here. And we have some really nice ryes up here, but yeah, as soon as you started reading off the specs, I was like, that's going to be a spicy meatball because you know, the higher, the, the, the higher, the high rye, I find that it, it, you know, bourbon, a lot of people talk about bourbon being spicy. Rye to me is, can sometimes be just a complete pepper bomb. But like you said, when your palate can acclimate to that, when it can move past mm-hmm. the spiciness, a rye, a really good rye can add a lot of range of, of complexity. I think it's just, it's, it's like scotch in a way that it's, it's a very acquired taste. Yeah. Uh, like I could see if you, if you gave this to somebody who had never had whiskey before, they would never drink whiskey again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you'd be a jerk for offering it to them. <laughs> obviously. Um, I'm noticing like a lot of like honey sweetness and a very interesting one of the notes that I read was cloves, which sounds kind of right to me because it's something like that kind of like spicy baking spice kind of flavor on the finish. Right. Like like a ham clove kind of thing. Yeah. Ham clove. I've never heard it called that. Mm. I mean, it's, it, you know, there is no such thing as a, thing as a ham clove. I just naturally oh, okay. assume they're like associated clove cloves. With... Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, normally. I thought maybe yeah. that was what they called them in, in Calgary. Yeah, that's right. It's a Canadianism. No, uh, I just normally associate cloves a lot with ham because typically in baking, that's really all I see it used with is, is hams to give it the ham a little bit of spice so the ham isn't so sweet. And uh, if you've ever bitten into a clove accidentally or purposely, you know that like it's, you know, it's like it's like biting into a peppercorn, but then there's a lot more to it and it tends to have really long, uh, long lingering finish. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and the more I drink this, the more interesting it gets. Like if you let it sit on your tongue for a little bit, it like I know some scotches do this, too. But it starts off really spicy, and then mm-hmm. it goes to like a hard candy kind of sweetness. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you swallow it, it just turns to straight spice. And I bet if you come back to that later on in the show, I bet there's going to be a lot of evolution in that spirit as your as your palate kind of comes around. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I am noticing on the Dead Guile, um, you know, the 40 IBUs, I am getting a lot of, or I shouldn't say a lot of it, but I am really picking out that hoppiness now. I feel like and, more than 40 IBUs of, of hoppiness comes through in that beer. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's really at the end of the, so you, like that maltiness is really just takes over your palate up front. But as the maltiness, the sweetness kind of evaporates, goes away in your tongue, you are left with the, the IPA, that hoppiness. And, you know, it's interesting because it's not overpowering. But it does provide a bit of a cleanser on the palate so that you're not just continuously tasting the sweet maltiness. And, you know, after maybe 45 seconds, a minute, I'm ready for another sip because my palate is readjusted. I think if that that hoppiness wasn't there, I'm not sure if I'd be sipping it as as much as I am. I think I'd probably be waiting two minutes because it would just be too sweet, if that makes sense. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And it's it's kind of crazy that, I mean, that's one of their flagship beers. So that that thing's been around for like 28 years. Um, And as far as I know, I don't think it's changed much if at all it's it's kind of amazing to taste a, a beer uh recipe that's that old and have it be something that kind of stands up to the test of time with modern beers and it's a good pairing with the cigar i mean i think this cigar is going to pair really well with a wide variety wide variety of spirits and beers because it's really designed to be that medium bodied cigar flavor that doesn't jack out your palate by one particular flavor or another 
Now I can say that the nuttiness that I was mentioning in the, in the kind of first third that I tend to get a lot of the Nico Rusticas is a little supercharged here. Now I am getting kind of in the middle third here, but I am getting a lot more of that, um, you know, like a, almost like a cashew or a sunflower seed where you get that sort of buttery sweetness on the, mm-hmm. on the nutty quality. And that's really coming through for me here. So any hint of spice, unless I retrohale is really not present at all. Instead, I get just a, a pro like that, like I said, it's a nutty sweetness, like that protein sweetness off nuts. Um, I get that a lot more uh, pairing with this rogue dead guy L than I did with pairing with the Yamazaki 12. And for this, for the rye, it's the exact opposite from my experience. I'm getting way more spice, uh, kind of layers of black pepper and baking spice like cinnamon. And now that I have clove on my mind, I taste clove. When I retrohale this Nicarustica, so I just took a sip and did a retrohale just to kind of see how my palate's evolving. And I get a really nice uh, spicy honeyness off the retrohale. And I don't think I was getting a lot of that sweetness, uh, at least in the first third. Maybe it's a spirit pairing. But I'm definitely getting a lot more uh, spicy honey. Um, I mean, it's a good pairing. I mean, this is a this is a no-brainer everyday pairing. A Nico Rustica and a Rogue Dead Guy. I'll, I mean, you know, I could I could knock back a few of these on a Sunday afternoon and I'd be a happy camper. And and they would last you through that belly, three or four mm. beers. Easily. So before we get into our next pairing and station break here, how are we doing for comments, questions, feedback from our audience? Uh, we've got some of the Drew Estate folks watching. Nice. Joe Grow and Labine, our favorite photographer down there. Tell them to hold on to their hats because we got something special coming up in three minutes here with a, <laughs> uh, with a Drew Estate spot. I worked really hard on it. Is, is yeah. it just an ad spot that says they good? No, that that would be funny it. though. If I had a thirty, if I had a thirty second spot, and all that thirty second spot said was they good, they good, they good, they good, <laughs> they good. I mean, that's kind of Logan style. It's not really, you know, it's not really my style, but that that'd be pretty funny. Uh, and we've also got in our uh, Cigar Federation chat room, Michael Harvey says he's about to light up his own Nico Rustica belly. With some Jameson Black Barrel, which is some good stuff. Ooh, that sounds good. See, I, I could see uh, uh, Irish whiskey going phenomenally because an Irish whiskey, a little bit like a Japanese whiskey, it's a lot more subtle, uh, especially with the Irish whiskey having the triple distillation, a mm-hmm. lot smoother. I, I think it might be a little dangerous actually pouring a Irish whiskey in a Nico Rustica belly. I think he's going to work his way through that bottle pretty quick. Well, he says his bottle's almost out, so that's his, that's mm-hmm. his built-in safety. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I don't have a built-in safety because you always got to have a backup bottle just in case. Exactly. So I'm going to get into our second pairing just like I did with the first and second. Then I'm going to interrupt it with our uh, word from our sponsor here. So this is something that I've been saving for the show. And uh, hopefully it's still good because uh, it's funky. It's funky. It's an oyster stout. Yeah, Ooh. oyster stout. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking oyster stout. It's got oysters in it. That's weird. It's, it doesn't have oysters in it. I'd be, I'd actually be super stoked if it did have oysters in it. Wait, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't. I always have, thought oyster stouts did. No, it's got no oyster. It's just, it's just grains and stuff. It's just a style, just a style. Um, it's from Porterhouse Brewing. Porterhouse Brewing was founded as a company in 1989 by Liam. That's a Scottish or a Irish name if I've ever heard one. Liam Lahart and Oliver Hughes. And uh, all they did, they started importing beers because they, they found there wasn't a lot of uh, craft brewery stuff available in Ireland. Um, 1996, they opened the first brew pub in Ireland called the Porterhouse in Temple Bar. So that's kind of cool. And then uh, they continued expansion in 1999. They've opened a Porterhouse in Covent, Covent Garden, London, and then uh, Glasnevin, Dublin. And then uh, I think they said they've also got a location now in New York, which is kind of cool. I'm going to hold this up for the camera. Um, you know, kind of looks like a porter. Very, very porterish. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't have the viscosity of a stout. It's got the thinness of a porter. Now, I've got it in a Guinness glass because uh, I, it seemed appropriate to me, even though it's not a Guinness. Given, given a little bit of love out there to Dublin, Ireland, for all our Irish listeners out there, I gotta get, give some some love out there. I do love a good Irish Guinness stout. Very delicious. Um, but I'm not gonna take a sip. Uh, maybe I'll nose it here. It's funky. I don't know what to make of that. It's funky. 
it's it's got a funk to it. I don't know. I don't know how to describe that. I'll give it some thought. But uh, I want to remind our audience that you are tuning in to Sharing Our Pairings. I am your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, joined by my co-host, Trippy Trent. We are broadcast around the world and picked up on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Thanks to all our podcast listeners out there. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for tuning in every week. Stay tuned for a word from one of our sponsors. The show brought to you by Drew Estate. Until June 30th, if you're a Drew Diplomat member, you attend a rewards program event and make a promotional purchase, you will receive a Liga Privada Velvet Rat. You'll also be entered to win a Drew Diplomat Pewter Ashtray, Mega Standing Ashtray, or the Swag Closet Human, or dubbed the Divorcinator. All these products were built and designed by Drew Estate Subculture Studios. If you're not a member, download the Drew Diplomat app from the Apple Store or Google Play Store today. Your estate, they good. So I'm going to take some sippies here and uh, let you talk about your third and final pairing of the night, Trip. Uh, so my third pairing is one that's it's been on a couple times, but I feel like it's it's just always a solid pairing, and I I would be remiss if I didn't have at least one stout with a broadleaf pairing. Nice. Uh, so this is Prairie Artisan Ale's bomb, big old exclamation point, and. For the first time, I actually, so the last time I had him on, I just kind of talked about the beer. And I actually looked into the history, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so Prairie was founded by two brothers, Chase and Colin Healy, in Oklahoma in 2012. Chase was a, he had been head brewer at a couple of breweries, and he had uh, worked in the beer industry. And Colin was an artist. So all of these cool labels that have i mean they've just got like they're just interesting Mm -hmm. this one has all sorts of circles and different patterns so colin uh his job is basically just artwork and chase handled everything else um so when they first started they didn't even have a brewery they were brewing at krebs brewing company in 2013 they actually did a kickstarter and started their own brewery but they still brewed the stuff like bomb uh back at krebs and they focused on making the weird stuff there. So everything that they made at their own brewery, everything was barrel aged, no matter what. Wow. They made a lot of sours, a lot of just beers with some funk in them. And uh, about a year ago, they actually got acquired by Krebs. So now Krebs owns Prairie. And I did a little research because it was like, I mean, this guy seemed like he was totally into making these beers. And in his words, basically, uh, to kind of summarize his words, he thought that Prairie got to a point where it needed to get bigger. I mean, it, it kind of exploded. It's crazy popular. And they needed to uh, focus on getting bigger. And he wanted to focus on making weird beers. So his buddy at Krebs, who helped them initially kind of start brewing bought the company and kept him sort of as a consultant so he works at their brew pub which is at the second location that i talked about and still makes weird beers and he has now started his own independent brewery called american solera where all they do is make weird beers Uh, so to talk a little bit about prairie bomb it's an imperial stout that is 13 percent alcohol Aged with coffee, cocoa nibs, vanilla beans, and ancho chili peppers. It good. It sounds like a bizarre combination, but somehow they make all of those flavors that shouldn't go together work. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a couple sips of this delicious black as night stout. Um, get my motor oil on. It's so good, so good, and it's so viscous. I mean, I don't know what the. Uh... I don't know what the, uh, I forgot the viscosity rating, the, what the, the measure is for viscosity, but I feel like that's one of the thickest stouts I've ever had. It's delicious. Um, yeah. g- getting back to the uh, Porterhouse Brewing Oyster Stout, uh, a little bit of the specs, it's 4.6% ABV. So I've kind of got these out of order because uh, it's a little bit less ABV than the Dead Guy Ale, which uh, come to think of it, I don't think I, I mentioned what the ABV on the Dead Guy Ale was. That's my bad. So, uh I think you mentioned every other detail possible yeah. except the ABV now that I think about I, it. Yeah, so it's uh, 6.8% on the Dead Gal Ale. So I have these a little bit out of order, but that's okay. Uh, it's still good. So it's 4.6% ABV. Specs on that, they use uh, 
pale malt, roasted barley, and black malt, and flaked barley for the grain. So there's a lot of uh, malts there. For the hops, they use Galena, and we've seen Galena used a lot in uh, porters. Uh, Nugget and East Kent Goldings, which makes a lot of sense, especially for its uh, UK style of uh, porter. Mm-hmm. And uh, so far, so good. It's it's a little bit on the thin side. I think I think I'm, I jacked up my order here. It's got some interesting character to it. It's got a little bit of the maltiness of like that that rogue dead guy ale. So it's got the uh, maltiness of an ale. It's got a little bit of the chalk character of a porter, but both of them are not forward. So it's it's quite subtle, especially at four point six percent ABV. Uh, it, it's very easy drinking. I'm gonna have to take a couple more sips of this and take a retro hell to really get a true sense of this. And I'll let you talk about that delicious Prairie Bomb. So the thing that always brings me back to Prairie Bomb is that it's got every single flavor you could want in moderation. Yeah. Which is kind of matches with the Nicarustica, I think. It's got a little bit of spice. You just get a touch of heat from those chili peppers, uh, but you more get kind of that chipotle sweetness and smokiness. Um, and then the coffee, vanilla, and cocoa just make it taste like a more rich version of a stout. You're not really getting those flavors by themselves. You're getting the amalgamation with the flavors of the stout, which all of those flavors are typically present in a stout. And then it's got a hoppy bitter finish. It's just got everything you could want. You know, sweetness. The only thing it doesn't have, I guess, is sour. It's got sweetness, spice. There's almost a little saltiness, but it's hard to place whether that's actually there or just perceived. And then it's got just those layers of stouty flavors. Uh, that are cemented by those additions. And I think it's very good, especially with this cigar. One of the things I failed to mention on this Oyster Stout is it had a kind of a cool cap. So instead of just a regular bottle cap, it's got a pull tap, which I don't oh. think I've seen. So it makes it super easy, um, you know, easy to uh, to open up and drink. And it's interesting. It's funny because uh, this is one of the few times where I'd say the beverage that I'm pairing with is being. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say run over by the cigar, but the beverage is really serving to support the cigar entirely. Um, so I'm not really getting a lot of the nuances of the beer. What I am getting is a supercharged Nico Rustic experience. So I think you were mentioning earlier a little bit of that Woody character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm getting it in spades. So I'm getting spices. I'm getting that, that nuttiness I was talking about. I'm getting this nice dry oak uh, coming through. And then I'm getting a little bit of post-draw sweetness. So this beer... Sadly, is getting run over by the cigar, but the plus side is the cigar experience is being kicked up. So, you know, it's tough to say like whether that's pairing that pairing is working for me because on one hand, you know, I'm kind of throwing the beverage to the side, but on the other hand, doing a great job of making the cigar experience fantastic, which is always a plus, especially if you're paying, you know, six, seven bucks for a cigar. Yeah. The the prairie bomb overruns the cigar a little bit but i can forgive it because it brings out like you were talking about it brings out some woodiness and it brings out a lot of spice i'm getting way more spice on the retro hail than i was before um, and i think that's because of the kind of sweetness of the beer the sweetness of the beer does cover up some of the sweetness of the cigar uh, but i think it kind of makes up for it oh huh. yeah i'm um I mean, like I said, I'm loving the cigar, but the the beer is just, it's just, it, you know, it's its a beer and I'm, I just can't pick out of the nuances of the beer because the, um, the cigar is really just taking over, which depending on how you want to pair, whether you want to pair for your cigar or pair for your spirit or try to find something in between, this could work really well for you. Um, so I'm going to run back over the uh, the three beverages of the night here and kind of talk about our experiences. So uh, first of all, I had the uh, Yamazaki 12 from Suntory Beam. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, it goes a lot with really any Drew Estate product, even the um, really full, like even a Drew Estate number nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, still goes well because it's got, it's like I said, it's more of a scotch style. Uh, I would rate that as an 88-89 pairing. Um, it's a no-brainer pairing. Now, you may not want to crack out your Amazaki 12 because, as we said, it's kind of tough to come by and uh, tough to say whether you want to pair that. But if you're looking for something to pair really well with the Yamazaki, Nika Rustica is great, and I think the rest of the Drew Estate lineup goes really well. How would you rate your first pairing? Uh, i gotta, I got to take another sip here. 
Call for it out. Gotta refresh that palette. Yeah, I should I should have thought to do that, but I was busy listening to you. Just ramble on, talking talking nonsense. Yeah, that the woodiness and the nuttiness is what really comes through. I think it's a good pairing because neither they're kind of almost contrasting flavors, but not quite. Um, in a way that you get more flavor out of the beer. After you smoke the cigar, you get more flavor out of the cigar after you take a sip of the beer. Uh, this pairing, I think, is fantastic. I would give this one a 92. Nice. The uh, second pairing of the night, which I think might be my favorite, um, and I think that's just because it's an ale, and this particular cigar is just brilliant with an ale. The uh, Rogue Ales and Spirits Dead Guy Ale. I'm going to take a little sip. <coughs> Great multi character. So good. Finishes with a little bit of um, hoppy bitterness. Just enough to cleanse the palate. But uh, to me, this this cigar goes really well with ales. I think there's a lot of different ales in the market that would go uh, fantastically with it. To me, it's a 90-91. This is a pairing that I would seek out actively. Um, and I think, you know, I'm going to have to revisit the Nica Rustica with a range of ales in the future. How about your second pairing of the night with that uh, beast of a rye? Um, I, I do think... I, I didn't think so at first. I think the rye could use a little water to go along with this cigar. Uh, I can see that. People who, people who are watching the split cam may have noticed I took, I inhaled after taking a sip of this rye, uh, and that was a big mistake. I mean, it's just, it, there's so much alcohol in it, and it's so young. I mean, I've had 111-proof whiskeys that I have no problem with. I've had 60%. 63% whiskeys that are easy drinking. Uh, this one is definitely a little harsh. Um, and of course, I would attribute that to being only three years old. I mean, typically when you're getting into those cask strength levels, you're looking at 10 years plus. Yeah. But that being said, uh, if, if you gave this to me, I would have guessed that it was a seven-year whiskey, not a three-year I, I just think it overruns the cigar a little too much. It does bring out good flavors, but it's just too strong to go along with a medium-bodied cigar like this. If you'd have rated it out of 100, where would you put it? Uh, 86. All right, so you're not going to be seeking that out anytime soon. Um, getting to the last pairing of the night, the Oyster Stout from Porter, Porterhouse Brewing. Great beer. Very, very good beer. But um, with the cigar, yeah, cigar just, I mean, it just, it so supercharges the cigar. It's amazing. So I just went through the entire spectrum, and I really don't get any woodiness out of this cigar until I get to that oyster stout. And then I get, like, Spanish cedar, oak, all this subtle nuance of, of wood that just isn't there until I get to this oyster stout. So, you know, I'm, I'm conflicted because on one hand, as a, like as a generic pairing, I would say it doesn't work for the beer. It works fantastically for the cigar. So I'd say it's 86, 87. But if you're looking to really um, provide support for the cigar, then it's a 90, 91 because it just brings all of these flavors that aren't present in the cigar with these other pairings to the forefront. So I'm, I'm really conflicted on this last pairing. Uh, and so before I get to my pairing, I want to say two things. So first of all, uh, we got a shout out from Jesse for my fantastic hat that his guys painted for me. Uh, I like when I saw the guy painting this hat, I thought that they're going to lose that thing and I'm never going to see it because they're going to want to keep that. Yeah. Uh, and Je I think Jesse kind of wishes that they had because it turned yeah, out so good. It, um, it looks it looks for the for the audience out there that's tuning in via podcast. It looks like it's been stitched onto the hat. Yeah, it looks doesn't look like, like a, it's been painted. It's a 3D bubble embroidered like piece that's on here and from more than like three feet away you can't tell the difference because they got the oh. shading just perfect uh, great work it. and then the second thing i want to say is how much cigar do you have left you have raged on that thing i've i've just been raging and i mean this is absolute props to this belly so look at look at how much i've got left i think yeah, we're almost at the same yeah point. we're almost the same and your cigar was like four inches longer than mine yeah, I've been raging, and props to the cigar, the fact that it's not getting hot, it's not getting spicy, it's not getting overwhelming, and I've been raging on it the entire time. And 
to, for my last pairing, the there's there is not a balance of power here. The cigar is if the flavors were a little bit different, the cigar would be demolished by the beer, by mm. by the prairie bomb. But the flavors go to, together so well that I still get a ton of flavor from the cigar, even though I've got this powerhouse of a beer. Um, and I would give this one, I think, kind of the same as the IPA, actually, 92. They both go fantastic with the cigar in completely different ways. That makes sense. Um, I, I am surprised that the uh, the beer isn't running the cigar over because that Prairie Bomb is, like you said, it's it's every flavor that can be found in a stout and more. Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd say that like, if I were to pick a handful of best stouts ever, to me, that's one of those stouts that ranks 100%. And it's it's every normal. single flavor that you could find in a stout turned up to 11. Mm-hmm. Um, but somehow the cigar still comes through and it actually goes really well with the beer uh, because their flavors go together. Yeah, really well. I think a like a Liga Nine, like a really full bodied broadly, would go a little better with this particular stout. Um, but I mean, this one shines as it is. All right. So uh, for those who are tuning in live, stay around for our after dark segment. We'll we got a little bit of cigar here to finish. But uh, to all of our other live listeners on Armed Forces Radio Network, uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Hope you guys stay safe. Have a great weekend. Have the chance to enjoy a great cigar during your rack time and downtime. And thanks very much for your sacrifice wherever you're stationed in the world. We know you guys are built to do things we are not built to do. Stay safe. Have a great weekend. And as we say, drink better, drink less. So we got uh, we got a pretty cool show lineup coming up. Uh, although it's going to be a little sparse next week, uh, we got Jack Taranio of Taranio Cigars coming on tomorrow night for Cigar Chat. Yep. And uh, Jack's always a good time. He's uh, you know quote unquote the gentle giant. He's, yeah. he's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm I'm excited to talk to him now that he's back with uh, back with Taranio because mm-hmm. I, the last time he was on the show, I wasn't around. I wasn't on the show, but I of course watched it. He was still with Azan. Uh, and I, I'm excited to see how he's, you know, what direction he's kind of taken Taranio cigars, because I feel like Taranio cigars kind of went through a period there after their acquisition where they weren't as appreciated mm-hmm. anymore. And I think they're starting to come back. Yeah, I think so, too. And it's it's funny that the cigar line has the namesake and then the, the guy who, you know, was the namesake of the brand left and came back. But it's, you know. He said it's like coming home, and I could definitely see that, especially if you start the brand. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, we're, we're obviously looking forward to seeing everybody at the IPCPR, and Jack is one of those great guys to see at the IPCPR. He's, he always makes for an entertaining interview. And then uh, next week, unfortunately, uh, my gig, which is uh, Cheap Smokes and Cigars, uh, we're going to be doing a blitz of events all week. So uh, I start at the store, which is very conveniently located down at the end of my block. So, you know, <laughs> I, I always say to the owner, I'm like, Hey man, anytime you want to watch, do a cigar event, any kind of cigar event. I mean, I literally can walk three blocks to the store and do a cigar event and we can rage all night. I'm totally cool with that. So we're going to start there and then we're going to work our way North in Alberta. And I'm going to end up in Fort McMurray. For those of you who are not aware Fort McMurray is seven and a half hours north of Calgary. So I'm kind of going to wind my way up through St. Albert, through Bonneville, and then eventually to Fort Mac, and then making my way back. So makes for a very busy week next week. But, uh, you know, smoking some good cigars, meeting some some good people. It'll be it'll be a lot of fun, but it is work. Yeah, it's, it's still work. Um, but, I mean, it's better than being on the phone doing sales, right? Copy that. <laughs> Absolutely. I like doing cigar sales in person. What's good? Everything. Smoke it. That's my sales pitch. Just smoke it. It's good. We wouldn't have it in the humidor if it wasn't. Um, there you go. So I was mentioning uh, pre-show that uh, I finally got my dash cam up and running. And I posted that on Facebook for those of you who follow me on Facebook or my Facebook you, friends. You immediately got some footage I mean, of an yeah. almost accident. I mean, it's so funny because, you know, the whole reason I got the dash cam was because uh, I was really getting into daily incidents that were getting more and more aggressive. And I was saying, you know, it's only really only a matter of weeks or months before I finally get clipped. And uh, really this morning, my my ride to work, there was some shenanigans. And then there was a near miss where an uh, uh, escape 
uh, just about sideswiped me. She she did that uh, classic signal and move, and we were traveling at about 120 kilometers an hour, which I think is like 77 or 76 miles per per freedom. And uh, yeah, really, you can't really tell by the dash cam because it's a wide angle, so it seems like she's got like a half a car length in front of me, and it looks like she might be cutting me off. But the actuality, as you're the driver, my car was about maybe a quarter of the way up her vehicle. So all I caught out of the corner of my eye was the signal coming on and her vehicle coming over. And when you've got, you don't know how much that vehicle weighs, but I got to figure it's like 3,500, 4,000 pounds. And that vehicle was coming in. And so I had, you know, a split second to react. So I was, I was thinking to myself, it's going to be kind of funny to look at the uh, timestamp after the fact and see how fast I reacted. And I'm going to pat myself on the back here because I'll give you a uh, virtual pat on the back. Yeah. Virtual pack because I, I reacted instantaneously. So basically I was doing driver avoidance uh, and I was out of her way by the time she realized that she was going to come into my lane and hit me. So by the time she was correcting to go back into her lane, I would already moved out of the lane and into the other lane safely away. Um, but it all happened in like a matter of two and a half seconds, which is, you know, again, why I got the dash cam, not, you know, I obviously want to have some entertaining footage on YouTube. But in case somebody does hit me, I want some backup to say, yeah, here's an example of someone who didn't check their mirrors, didn't do any kind of shoulder check, just decided to come into my lane at highway speeds without looking and just about crush me. And unfortunately, if she had hit me uh, at that speed, that that probably would have been uh, that probably would have been bad times for me. Yeah, that wouldn't have been great. I, so I, I'm as I've talked about before, I'm a motorcyclist. I I have a habit. So that is what we call a blind spot yep. down here in the States. Yep. I never, ever drive in somebody's blind spot. Never, ever, ever. Even if I have to kind of tailgate the guy in front of me, I'm going to be looking eye to eye with the person next to me. Yeah. Because I don't want to be in that position where I'm back at their rear quarter panel and they just, for whatever reason, don't even notice that I'm there. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people give... Um give shit to motorcycle riders for, for taking the edge of the lane. Um, but when you, when you're on the highway, if you are a rider, you really get a sense of why they do that really quickly because it gives you an extra buffer of maybe a second to a second and a half. Yeah. Or if someone does something stupid, you've got three quarters of a car length to get out of the way before you get crushed under this vehicle behemoth. Yeah, exactly. And, um, as any motorcyclist will tell you, cars have way better brakes than a motorcycle. Way better. Uh, I mean, you can stop in a couple hundred feet when you're going 70 miles an hour in a car. In a motorcycle, uh, your chances of going over the handlebars or just locking up the back are way higher. Um, so it's just so much safer to just get get out of there. Yeah, accelerate Sit out of the way. Out. I was actually kind of, because it is uh, motorcycle season now, which is a very short season in Canada, <laughs> between the seasons of gravel and snow, uh, I was expecting to see motorcycles more on the road, which I didn't see today. I, di- I did have, um, I don't know, it was really like 250cc, a little tiny motorcycle kind of cut me off downtown, which I just kind of chuckled at. He had to, he, he was in the uh, turning lane and he cut across uh, double white to come into my lane. But, you know, again, part of being a defensive driver is you just kind of got to keep an eye on the other drivers all the time and make sure you're uh, prepared for their uh, ridiculousness and shenanigans. And I was, so, you know, yeah. he probably didn't even notice. I'm sure he was like, oops. And that was the last time he thought about it. Yeah. But, uh, I am, I'm happy. Uh, my goal was to have this, uh, dash cam in place as my drive across Alberta. Uh, last time I went up to Bonneville, uh, on the way back, I had a, uh, big pickup truck, like a Ford F three fifty, hauling a horse trailer, uh, pull across the highway at highway. Sp- or I was at highway speed, uh, which is like 120, 125 kilometers an hour. And, uh, just with with maybe 150 feet, maybe 200 feet to go, just pulled across the highway. Oh. And it was just like, you know, this this is the kind of stuff, like, I'm not worried about people at 120 kilometers an hour most of the time taking me out. It's those crossroads where you've got farm vehicles, pickup trucks, or people dragging horse trailers that I'm really worried about because at that point, you know, maybe I'll kill the horse. But if I hit a horse trailer at those speeds, I'm going to be in big trouble. Thankfully, I've got an uh, airbag. But, you know, that's not an accident I want to be in the receiving end of. Yeah, definitely not. And and a dash cam gives you that little bit of extra insurance that you can say with definitive proof it was that guy's fault. Yeah. 
And I mean, <coughs> excuse me. And I, I think the other nice thing that's cool is that if I screw up, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not perfect. I'm definitely not a perfect driver. So it's kind of interesting for me to go back to a situation um, where I screwed up and look at the video and say, okay, you know, what did I do wrong here? Um, at what point, you know, was that driver visible or what, at what point should I've recognized that? I haven't run into that because it's only been one day, but um, I think I can see the analytical portion of me going back over the footage and saying, okay, well, you know, this was a sketchy situation. Should I have seen this coming? Was it my error? That kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the, the footage is fantastic. Like you can see crisp, crisp footage at 60 frames per second. So, um, you know, provide some, uh, some interesting viewing over a single malt. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I'm excited tomorrow night at a regular standard, regular standard time, cigar chat, 8 PM Eastern standard. Uh, no word yet as to whether our MFN CEO will be there or not, but if not, it'll be uh, Trippy and I hosting Jack yeah. Daniel. That'll be a great show. So make sure, make sure to tune into that. Trippy and I will try and squeeze in a pre-record for next week. Um, at this point with my timing. We don't know, 50, yeah. We don't know if next week's going to happen or not. It's kind of 50, 50. Yeah. So if, uh, if we don't make it, I apologize to our live listeners, uh, podcast listeners. You'll miss a week of sharing our pairings and I apologize in advance, but you know, that's just the way it goes. And then uh, we'll be back with our coffee, coffee, coffee segment, which is uh, round two with the tobacco special, which oh, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. I got to order some red eyes for that because I need that. Mm, I love that red eye, man. So good. So good. Yeah. So uh, we'll see if we can uh, maybe if we're not going to do a pre-record, maybe we'll have a special guest for that show. You never know. Could you be. never know. Um, but that'll be in uh, two weeks time if we don't, uh, pre-record and then, uh, we'll be back with some uh, special shows after that. If you uh, check out our event calendar, you'll see, we've got some guests lined up as we lead into our, uh, IPCPR coverage. So we're going to have some, uh, shows kind of tailored with guests leading into IPCPR. And then we're going to have our cigar chat, uh, which is just us rambling about what we expect out of this year's IPCPR. So look for that. Uh, of course, the IPCPR is, uh, I believe July 10th to the 14th. That's correct. And, our calendar is filling up pretty fast. Yeah, and uh, as always, we'll be there with some live coverage. You're going to see my face instead of Rob's uh, hideous mug this year. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you get for leaving for a good-paying job, Rob. Yeah, but, but Slag you. he'll still be on there because we're going to be interviewing him, I'm sure. Yeah, we're going to have, um, for those who have checked out our event calendar, we are going to have Robbie on for our uh, three-year anniversary show on the July, I believe it's July the 8th of my calendar. I've, I've been kind of living and dying by my calendar for the last couple of weeks. Um, not even close. It's July 5th. Not even close. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that'll be July 5th. And, um, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. Um, make sure to tune in to the uh, IPCPR coverage. You can either check out our IPCPR 2017 calendar at youtube.com we'll be posting those on uh, cigar federation as well so you can check that out there but we're gonna have some pretty awesome show coverage and as we say on share our pairings we do want you to drink better but we do want you to bring drink less